Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Clement, welcoming you to the latest from our Global Insight series, where we delve into the career paths of leading professionals from the world of football and sport and ask them, how did you get to where you are now? What were the issues that you faced and continue to face? In my role as a BBC broadcaster in radio and television, and also as an event host, including working with UCFB and their sister organization, the Global Institute of Sport, I love to hear people's stories. And today we're gonna to go into the world of the boardroom and find out what it takes to run a leading Premier League club from fan and now chairman of Crystal Palace, Steve Parrish. I think, Steve, to get straight down to business, I'll, I'll just ask you right between the eyes. What does a football chairman actually do? Well, I think it varies, really. I mean, I think it, 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 it's everything from probably just being somebody who writes the checks <laughs> all, all, all the way through to, you know, somebody that runs every aspect of the club. I think that um, <clears throat> it's... Um, you can do it any way you want to do it, really. If you buy a football club, can't you? You can decide how you want to run things. And um, I'm a kind of all-in kind of person, so I don't really – I'm not very hands-off. I'm not very good at, you know, okay, you know, this is a big thing in my life, but you just run with it. Here's a sort of set of guidelines and off you go. So because this was such a project that was so kind of dear to me, um it was something that i got very close to very early and even though i had some other investors at the beginning you know i've always run it in a very hands-on way so i'm a kind of executive chairman whereas other people do it differently you know they they've got other business interests or more business interests that they need to focus on on a daily basis and they and they delegate to to some staff you know so it's it's just different strokes for different folks really but you've got chief executive so do you play to strengths? Do you delegate the bits you're not good at or the bits that you perhaps don't like? Or are there areas where you acknowledge your chief executives maybe got more time or expertise? How do you divvy stuff up? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, in, in the way that we do it, you know, the hierarchy, if you like, I mean, we, I believe in very flat structures. I don't like lots of complexity or layers. Um, so I've got a fantastic team and obviously the operational um operating a football club is quite complex you know match day operation is very complicated you're running lots of little micro businesses so you're a caterer you're a restaurateur you're a merchandiser you know you're a clothing company um so you're many many different things as a football club in in what's you know a relatively small business really relative to what you know the, the kind of things that, that that those kind of events business or clothing business usually are so you know, you need a good team of people around you. Phil, who's been with the club 20 years now, has just an enormous amount of knowledge, uh, sits on the FA boards, you know, all of the different complexities and, and, and intricacies of running a football club, um, not least, you know, making sure all the supporters are safe and, you know, the operations are run efficiently and effectively, commercially, you know, helping with that. So we have a fantastic team at the club. In most businesses, probably my role would be CEO. Although it's, I'm slightly more hands-off than I would have been saying my advertising business in terms of some of those day-to-day -day operational things. You know, I'm not cleaning out the beer pumps and the, you know, things like that. Well, okay, fine. I'm glad you've clarified on that one. Do you want to, I mean, I always ask people how close what they are doing now is to what they pictured. Maybe when they were of an age like a lot of our students are. Uh, and I always slip in the kind of, is it, a happy accident that you're where you are now or is it is it by design and well you're celebrating 10 years of getting involved with palace you are a palace fan but do you want to take us on a brief sort of tour of your career to to the point you're at now sure i mean i think um i've never really had a plan i don't think it, 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 it i mean i obviously within a, a job that you've got or a project that you're on there's a plan of what you want to try and achieve and what you want to try and get to. But for me in my life, not really. You know, I I, I often argue that um, one of the strengths is being open to opportunities. You know, that big kind of decision-making moment in your life around 18 to 23, such a defining moment in people's lives. 
Um, and I always knew what I didn't want to do. And I think that that's probably one of my strengths. And uh, so when I got to 18, I was pretty sure I didn't want to go to university. Universities were very different places back in the early 80s. Um, they weren't very, they weren't lovely student accommodation. And, you know, it just wasn't the same sort of place. So um, I knew I didn't want to do that. I was sent by the careers officer to a few job interviews um, in insurance and things like that. And I knew I didn't want to do that. And I was struck off from the recruitment agency because I turned the job down <clears throat> because we were, it was a lot of unemployment and, and well, we've got you a job, you know, what, what more do you want? I remember going for the interview and, uh, you know, I predate computers in any kind of, you know, common, <laughs> common um, usage. So it was, it was a room full of people with those calculators with the, you know, and they were adding up numbers and then filling them in on a, on a spreadsheet, but a rotary pen, you know, on a spreadsheet. And it just looked, I mean, like the most mind numbing thing you could do. Um, so I turned it down and, um, I hate to think what would have become of me had I, you know, there's an enormous amount of pressure to take the job, you know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. From, from my parents at the time, from the recruitment company. It was just a much easier thing at 18 years old. I remember being in central London for one of the first times, you know, I'd only ever gone up there to visit and I'd go into a phone box in on London Wall and ringing my dad and telling him that it wasn't for me, the job, and I wasn't going to take it to his great horror, you know. At the time, I was putting up full ceilings with a mate and we were making quite a lot of money and I couldn't, it, the finances as well, I couldn't rationalise. I think it was something like, I seem to remember it was 4,300 a year or something, this job in insurance. <clears throat> and the train fare was 2,800. I mean, I just, <laughs> that, it, it, waste it, time. complete waste of time and, and just looked like misery. And, um, you know, the classroom environment, quiet, you know, was never for me. Um, so that, that was a big, important moment. And then I ended up, my dad actually got me an interview in a graphic arts um, business. I didn't I didn't know what it was. I worked there for four months. I had no idea what they did. Literally no idea what they did. There were people who would walk around with these pieces of film in their hand, calling it the blue and the red and the black. And I just looked at them like they were all mad. What are you talking about? It's a piece of black and white film. Um, but I was in the old kind of apprentice system. And um, I was... The, 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 it was transitioning from a craft to a skill because the computers were just coming in. And I was very fortunate in that I learned it both ways. I had an am, am, amazing um, couple of guys that took me under their wing and taught me how to produce uh, images in the old fashioned way, if you like, using chemicals and etch and, and staging paint and really understood the process. But then I was I, I was really fortunate because when I was at school, for some reason, I'd taken an extra subject, which anybody that knew me back then would tell you would be incredibly unlikely. I don't know how it happened, but we had one Apple II computer in a little cupboard in the school. And um, there was a guy called John Smith who, who I liked, and, and, and he was into this thing, and we could write little programs for it and make tanks go, you know, go across the screen. It was very you know, early stage computer games and, you know, basic edition and, and simple programs. So I did a computer studies OA level for some reason, which when I was parachuting into this graphic arts business in 1983, literally made me the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. I mean, I was literally the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. All, wow. of, these, all of these, and it was predominantly guys that worked in the industry, <clears throat> at all, you know, it was craft, you know, it was it was intricate painting of things and, you know, etching and, 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 you know, making things happen conventionally, working with cameras, photography, film, exposures, all this kind of thing. Painstaking to produce one ad. It was the ad, ad business that we were in. Um, and, and there were these computers and they were literally gathering dust, a lot of them, because they, you know, the, it was heavily unionized, you know. So the people that could have got access to it and, and understood it couldn't get into the industry. You know, it was a, so it was just an incredible piece of good fortune, really, really that, that, that ended up and very, very quickly. If you combine my kind of, um, uh, first of all, I loved it, right? So I found something I loved. And this is what I would always say to people. You know, that old adage, if you find something you love doing, you'll never work a day in your life, is so true. I mean, I, even when I had my business, when I got to the point I had my business, I was a con it was a constant surprise to my parents. 
that I'd achieved anything. I mean, there was literally nothing you could find in my schooling <laughs> that would lead you to believe that, um, and I'm not just talking about, you know, I wasn't particularly brilliant academically because I don't have a good memory for facts and it was all about remembering 1863 and not getting 64 and all that kind of stuff when we were young, in, you know, in our day. I hate to say, I don't know if you're as old as me, but, that, you know, around then. Um, you know, but I got by. I went to a pretty decent school. So I did okay, but I was never going to be spectacular academically. And I always wanted to do everything but work. You know, play football, uh, just anything other than work. Watch television, go around and see my mates. Um, I didn't have a diligence. My sister was a solicitor, had become a solicitor almost by that time. And she was incredibly diligent and hardworking and you know, spent hours and hours and hours writing her essays in the study. I just did as little as I could get away with, really, to get the homework in. Um, so I, it was just a surprise. But what the key to it was, I just found something I loved. You know, I didn't love, I mean, put me back now to do a history A-level, or I would absolutely love it. But back then, I didn't find any joy in any of those things. But we, I went into this graphics business, and we were producing these amazing images. That, As I said, computers had just arrived, so... You know, we, did, we, we, we could make people look like they were flying through the air or, you know, just create these incredible images. Very, very complicated to do, but, you know, you, you, you could do it. And you would see your work, you know, things that you've been involved in up around town. Um, but I just loved the process. I just literally went from being the laziest person on the planet to never wanting to leave the place. Um, mm. And I remember having a conversation with one guy who was in the union and heavily unionised. And he said to me, why do you do it? You know, you're learning this bit of machine. You could go home. Why are you doing it? And I said, look, even if you're right and the bosses are all terrible people, right, they can't take away from me what I learn. There's a machine sitting here that costs millions of pounds that nobody wants to go on because they think it's threatening their future. I'm going to learn it, right, because I've got a sneaky suspicion it's not going away. So I'll learn it. And, you know, I think it'll stand me in good stead. By my second or third year, I was running a huge department. They bought me this incredible company car. I, I honestly did, had so much money, I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, I literally live in with my mum. You know, I kind of almost had stacks of money in the thing because it was it was so, and, and everything just snowballed from there, really. You know, I loved it so much. Um, every single piece of new technology that came out, I was all over. Um, and in the end, that led me down a road to, you know, I moved jobs a couple of times. Um, eventually we found a piece of technology that was much cheaper to use, or to buy and use. It wasn't quite Photoshop, but it was a forerunner of that kind of thing. I got involved in that. I got involved in selling the product in the UK, ended up buying the company that I worked for rather than leave. Um, and then the, the internet came along. Up to that point, we struggled because we could only really sell our product in the UK because we had to send people physical things, some film or, you know, and then the internet came along and we could sell the products all over the world. So, you know, listen, I, I kick myself because I was very, very early into email and the internet. Um, I mean, I, by this time, I was a real IT geek. I'd kind of taught myself um, IT because I needed to make, it wasn't just a matter of one person sitting at the computer doing a job. The real challenge then was to get some kind of workflow where you could do a lot of work efficiently. Nothing really worked properly. You know, the technology wasn't like it is now. You know, it didn't. I mean, to give you an idea, we used to store one image of 300 megabytes on a disk this big in an wow. air-conditioned room. Um, I mean, it, it moved so quickly from that point. Um, and it was just a fantastic time. And then, you know, I got hold of the business, the internet came along. We grew the business all over the world, ended up with two, 3,000 people in about 13 physical locations. Um, but it was all came from one thing, really, which was not doing something I didn't want to do not being told this is what you should do, this is the pathway that's down for you, believing bizarrely for some reason that anything was possible, even though, you know, I knew academia wasn't for me, but I had a sneaking suspicion that it wasn't everything. You know, and as I used to say to people in my business, I mean, we were a very customer service orientated business, you know, there isn't a degree for customer service. You know, I employed some people that had amazing qualifications that were terrible at the job because, you know, they just didn't have didn't understand customers, didn't understand looking after them. It was never their fault, you know. And 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 we were just a very customer-centric, user-friendly business that wanted to be fantastic at what we did. And that was it, really. I mean, that's the, the simplest life lesson I can give to people is find something you love doing, 
and if possible, find a way to own a bit of it if you can. Which if is what you do. And yeah. then, and then, ultimately, made the money that enabled you to buy into Palace as part of part of a four-way split in two thousand and ten through selling the business out. I just want to wrap this section up by asking you two questions. Do you think? The putting up ceilings and appreciating what you were getting paid with your mate was an early indication of your entrepreneurial spirit. And also, you mentioned your old man. Your old man was a very heavy hitter in negotiating trade unionist. Do you, do you think there was an influence from him that comes into you that, that is, you know, some of those negotiating skills, have they come in handy over the years? Yes. I think one of the things is that we never accepted the status quo in my house you know everything was always questioned and challenged wow now i know it's it's common now but we were herded much more down a, a kind of commonly held opinion weren't we and uh you know look i i what my dad's role in changing the way that the working people were treated in this country you know i'll be forever proud of him you know i mean and and, and the unions played a massive part um in in achieving the society that we've got now obviously you know that that it kind of got to a point particularly with the print unions where they sort of became like they became so good at it they held back the tide of progress <laughs> uh, but you know that it, 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 but certainly negotiating disagreeing um arguing you know it was it was quite i did a politics a level you know we were quite a political household in terms of you know discussing things um, so, yes, absolutely, you're a product of your upbringing, certainly, you know, all of those things um, help. The most important thing, you know, is they gave me a lot of love and a lot of confidence to go out into the big wide world. And if you fail, they'll always be there for you, you know, and you can and you can try something else. So, um, you know, I was very lucky in, in that regard and, and, and other people, you know, don't have that. And I understand that, you know, it's, it's not easy for everybody to just say, oh, I want to do what I want to do. You know, you've got to pay the bills and all that kind of stuff. So I was definitely fortunate with that. Yeah. So Steve, to come back to the happy accident question, take us back to 2010 and the acquisition of Palace, the circumstances, how you pulled the consortium together and sort of got yourself into this position for which, you know, the vast majority of people will know you. Well, look, I've never, I genuinely have never done anything for money ever, in my, you know, in my, I'm, apart from having enough, you know, I need it, you wanted enough. So I like the four ceilings, you know, because it gave me enough money. I liked, when I got to the point where I was making more money, honestly, than I knew what to do with, even back in, you know, the mid eighties, you know, it, money was never really my driver. You know, it was, it was building something, making something bigger, the fun of it, producing things in a different way. Um, by the time I got to sort of the late, to the sort of 2008 2009 the noughties as they're known i i was pro it was big my business you know and it was i was busy and 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 I, and I just sort of reached that tipping point where i didn't love it as much you know it was a little bit groundhog day now if i wanted to make money i should have kept it right you know i mean i would have definitely sold it for five or six times even you know just because it, it what I was doing at the time still wasn't recognised as the way forward for um, advertising in some ways. Whereas now, executing things, making things happen, make you know, creating ads on a large scale is obviously you know the biggest challenge. Having the idea and and, and producing an idea is is, is less involved. So, um, but I always loved Crystal Palace. Somebody who went to my school said that when I was a kid, I said that I would own it one day. I, I genuinely don't remember that. I mean, whoa. Somebody said that. There's somebody who came to a game from my primary school. But, you know, I'd watched it from afar, um, go through its various trials and tribulations. And around about 2009, I guess it was, somebody came to me, Ron Notes, it was, and he said, look, you know, we're, we're looking for people to get involved. The people that have lent money to the club are looking for somebody to buy the debt of the of the thing because they want to get out. And anyway, we got involved in that. It was never really going to work, you know. It, 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 I didn't really want to do it because I, you know, your football club that you love owing you money, you know, it's not the debt that you're ever really going to collect on, is it? You know, it's it, it's going to be a difficult situation. 
And while we were trying to work something out, because if we wanted to show a bit of winning, you know, while we were trying to work something out, the club got put into administration in January 2010. Um, and then events kind of took over. You know, I kept saying to the administrator, look, I really don't want to do it. I've got a big business. I don't have time. The numbers are frightening, you know. Um, but eventually, because it was the recession, financial recession, the last one, you know, that we had, uh, it became apparent that no one was going to buy it. And got to the end of the season, had a very, very important win against Sheffield Wednesday, kept us in the championship. Crystal Palace haven't been out of the top two divisions for 44 years. There's only 10 clubs that haven't been out of the top two divisions. So it was a massive moment for the club. Yeah. Um, but there were just so many complications. The stadium wasn't owned by the club. The club didn't have a training ground. We fundamentally had a few players and a right to play in the championship. That was really what, what you were buying. It needed 12 million put into it day one just to pay what was owed. Um, and um, it was a very difficult negotiation because the stadium had been bought by a guy called Paul Kelmsley and his company that had bought it had gone into administration. The bank that lent them the money was HBOS. That had gone into administration. <sighs> and there was just this incredible moment, Mark, when after looking at it for six months, people like P. Diddy getting involved and being interested in it, and it kind of got to the bottom of the night where the administrator said, look, you know, we're going to have to close the club unless you, unless you do it. And we went back one more time to try and buy the stadium, but we just couldn't get anybody to listen to us. Understandably, you know, they had billions and billions of assets in this bank. And while I was trying to buy a stadium, they paid 12 million for, for 3 million, something I was offering. Um, and I sat on my sofa one bank holiday Monday, this, and this taught me the power of football. And um, I've created this thing called CPFC 2010 because I didn't want my, you know, if you don't do it, it can be a bit difficult and you start getting all the pressure. So I've created this thing called CPFC 2010. I had one possible investor that would come in with me and I was talking to a couple of others. Anyway, it, it became apparent they weren't going to sell us the stadium. So I issued a statement saying, look, you know, I really tried to do this, but there's no future for this football club if it doesn't own its own stadium because in central London, we're not going to be able to build another one anywhere. And, you know, the match day revenues are important. We need control over it. We can't have be paying a million pound rent for a stadium that we can't invest in. Blah, blah, blah. So we issued this statement. Somebody asked me for it the other day. And I put it on one of the club's forums. And within five minutes, it was running as a ticker symbol on the bottom of Sky Sports News. And then a chain of events occurred that, that was incredible. So that day, some fans had been at the ground um, protesting, demonstrating, you know, up, making their feelings known that, that they don't want the club to go under. And then this statement was issued. And basically what they heard was, there's a bank in London that are stopping us surviving. <laughs> so so on Tuesday morning, thousands of them turn out up outside Lloyd's Bank in central London to protest the fact that we're out and there's a deal that can't be done. Within a few hours, we had a phone call from the administrator of the bank saying we need to sit down and have a meeting because obviously somebody appeared from behind their curtain, you know, at the, at the, in central London and seeing all these fans. What are they doing? Who are they? There's all sorts of legends that I was in the building and all this kind of nonsense. But anyway, they called and I suppose at that point then I'd sort of run out of excuses. You know, I didn't have any more excuses to not do it. Um, and and so, so we bought it. Me and I've got three other guys involved. Um, and I learned, I saw pretty quickly that it was going to be tough. Um, the first season, Dougie became manager. We just about survived. Uh, we were trying to build a team on a shoestring. People were spending big money in the championship even then. You know, our first game was Leicester. Um, Wilf Daha scored the first goal. Um, so, you know, it, it became apparent very, very quickly that you, I couldn't do both. You know, I couldn't run my advertising business in the same way that I had. And I couldn't run the club <clears throat> and do justice to the people that give me money to look after it. You know, I could see that it was easier to lose their money than it was to keep it or, or, or make something better. And that, you know, we needed to do something pretty extraordinary in order to make it all work. And, it, you know, as we all know now, you know, it doesn't really work in the championship. 
Um, I think there's a bit of a better model now in the championship for selling players, but back then, you know, it was difficult even to get value for your players. So, um, you know, we, 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 from that moment on, I knew I sold the advertising business fairly quickly. Um, <clears throat> I stayed on for another year, but I didn't have to work as hard. You know, I didn't have to do as much and really threw myself into the football club. And it became, you know, I just transitioned from one thing I loved doing into another thing that, that I loved doing. Um, much more pressure, much more public. It's a very, very different set of challenges. Although in the end, they're all the same. You know, businesses pretty much are all the same. You know, you have to understand the business you're in create a network of people you trust and it's pretty much about making decisions right it's just making decisions and you try and make more right ones and wrong ones in the context of the environment you're in and see if you can move the whole thing forward and that's probably when i do start to have a plan you know try and find what is the plan for this thing how can i be where do i find my niche how does it how is it made better and probably from afar you know, the thing that frustrated me about Crystal Palace is when I was a kid and I went to Sellers Park, it was pretty much the same experience as if I went to Highbury, right? I mean, it wasn't different, really, you know. It was, and then, of course, by the time I buy Crystal Palace, the Emirates has been built and, you know, we're still, I mean, it was, the club hadn't owned the stadium for 10 years. I mean, it was so run down. It was extraordinary. I mean, literally hadn't been touched. And where I had been touched... It was at the minimal cost possible, you know. So we need CCTV. Let's just string the cables between the two stands. So um, I had an idea, you know. I, I, you know, the stadium needs to be improved. We need our own practice facility. The academy is really the lifeblood of the club. We need to do something about that. It's all taking me longer than I hoped it would, but we're getting somewhere now, you know. And um, it, it, it's been a fantastically enjoyable journey because it's my club and I love it. Uh, but it certainly isn't a money-making, you know, it's not something I would recommend to people if they want to make money. All, all your recent sort of communication, or a lot of it seems to me to be quite a big strategic vision that you have, are looking again at the fact that South London hasn't got uh, another club. So you're, you know, Premier League club. So there's... Yeah, yeah, there's many other clubs. Clubs. You should be fair to Millwall and Charlton. I mean, there's some big clubs in South London. But we've yeah. occupied this position of a Premier League club, you know, now for the eight years, which is which is unique. It's two point eight million people in South London. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you compare that to some of the clubs that we compete with in the Premier League, you know, we've got one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand people in their, you know, in their entire town. You know, so yeah. um, we're very fortunate. We um, and we can exploit that, and we've got a fantastic catchment area for talent. So yeah, we have we do have a strategy. Making it happen is a little bit difficult because obviously financially. Much as people think that the streets are paved with gold in the Premier League, you spend a lot of money on wages. So getting some money outside of that to create and build the infrastructure. When we're competing with clubs that have got fantastic infrastructure and don't need to spend any money on it, is a challenge. But it's one we're, we're willing to accept and it's the only way forward for the club, really. Yeah, but... You know, and thank you for just helping to clarify as I hesitated. I did mean Premier League clubs in South London. You also talked about the catchment area. There was some stat I read 14% of all Premier League players are within a 10 mile radius of Selhurst Park. Did I see that one? Is that correct, Steve? So, The Guardian um, ran an article, I think, not last season, the season before, and it, it may actually be more now. So, 14% of all the English qualifying Premier League players. English qualifying Premier League, I was going to say. In Premier League squads that season came yeah. from South London, basically, within a 10-mile radius. So if you yeah. look now, you know, Sancho, uh, Ryan Brewster, Loftus-Cheek, hudson Doy, you know, it's a, it's a it's a huge number of, um, of players. They call it Concrete Catalonia is the, is the nickname for it. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. I mean, Croydon... Brilliant. Croydon is Lunar House, so you have just such a rich, diverse um, cultural, um, high density, high, enormous amount of young people. Um, it's just a fantastic uh, area for creating footballing talent. But the the other big project is obviously the development of the ground, in particular the main stand, increasing eight, uh, the capacity by 8,000, which would take you... Up to the sort of level of, I guess, Newcastle, Everton, Villa, etc. But how much are you governed by 
safety to make sure that you stay in the Premier League and pushing the boat out to take you to the next level, which might make staying in the Premier League that little bit easier with the extra resources, etc. Did that question make sense, Steve? Yeah, I mean, and you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, as with, as with developing any business, right, it's always a balance, isn't it, between what you need to do now and what you need to do to improve going forward. How much of your income do you invest? How much of your income, you know, do you spend on, on the now? And, and, and that is laid bare in, in the Premier League because you have this huge jeopardy of, of, of relegation every year. So obviously staying in the league gives you a greater chance of fulfilling those things. But the money that you need to spend to stay in the league means that you, it's very difficult to find the free cash, you know, for long-term infrastructure products. So, you know, look, it's it's something that we're we're wrestling with. Um, I think, you know, the, the academy will be open towards the end of November, which is a fantastic facility. So that's a box ticked. You know, I'm getting one part of it done. The stadium financing um, is set against the backdrop of a squad that's, you know, getting a bit older and that we, you know, we're trying to transition that squad into some younger um, talent. Um, and obviously we have to invest in the plan side of the academy as well. So there's lots of gravitational pulls for the money. And, um, you know, we're trying to find ways that we make it all work. But staying in the division is obviously pretty key to those plans. Where does your fanship sit in making your decisions and and is the sensation of victory or success slightly dampened by the responsibility that you carry to the club as opposed to being able to just jump up and down and you know enjoy the moment yeah there's very little jumping up and down and enjoying the moment really you know i mean but we have a fantastic fan base you know we are really blessed at Crystal Palace with our fan base. Maybe it's a, it's, it's a product of what they've been through, two administrations, you know, more 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 misery than, than, than pleasure a lot of the time. Um, maybe it's just something to do with, the, you know, with the area. Um, but they really want to see the club progress. You know, they're certainly willing to suffer things in the short term, you know, in order to see the club um, progress. And, you know, they have their points of view in different fringes but generally i'm fortunate in i work in a backdrop of i think fantastic understanding from the supporters that it isn't always just about today it's about you know trying to build a, a better club and in fact i would say that's probably my biggest pressure you know when i see people say yeah but what's happened with the stadium what's happened with it you know academy people want to see progress in life for your individuals you want to feel like there's progress and certainly for football supporters you want to see their club progressing going in the right direction and i think as long as we're doing that we we'll keep everybody you know the vast majority of people on side hmm. i mean we've all had our own way of coping with covid and the lockdowns and where we are now where we are now is we look as though we're getting ever closer to another lockdown etc just just that sense of responsibility to not just your own life but to all the people that rely upon crystal palace the supporters you know the players all the staff all around during something you know as crisis ridden as a as a major world pandemic just how much strain has that put on you steve i don't honestly i mean it's you know for all of us as individuals it's been a challenge isn't it i mean i know different to anybody else but no look we, we, we we've been relatively blessed you know, in that we managed to get the business, you know, or, or the events back up and running. The Premier League is the best league in the world. So we had a good situation with our broadcasters. And I think, you know, it was really easy outside of that to do the obvious right things and to contribute as much as we could to the things in society that would make a difference. You know, the foundation that we've got, the people at the club all wanted to go the extra mile during the crisis. You know, we were fortunate in that we, you know, we didn't furlough anybody. We, you know, nobody was at risk of losing their job. Um, we certainly didn't th think that player pay cuts or anything like that were warranted in terms of the revenue reduction we had. And we did have a big revenue. It probably cost us around 30 million as a club. You know, it's not in inconsequential. And it, wow. and it costs more. It costs the bigger clubs even more than that. But, you know, we felt that we'd been prudent going into it. And so we were in a good situation. So a lot of our decisions were pretty straightforward to be honest, in terms of 
um, it, it felt like a time where, you know, doing the right thing and, and being part of a community that were trying to solve this thing um, was obvious, you know, in most situations. So I think, you know, I, I like to think throughout that we did. Now, obviously, you know, it's a little bit more of a challenging time, isn't it? Opinions more fragmented about what we should do. Um, you know, the government obviously is stressed in terms of the amount of support that they've given to many, many industries and are looking for different solutions. Things are very difficult. We understand completely in League One and League Two, which is why the Premier League have, you know, put a rescue package in, 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 in there. You know, I think that you'll see none of us want to see clubs go under because of COVID. And I think the Premier League committed to making sure that that, that doesn't happen. Um, uh, but with all these situations, you know, as they get deeper and longer, they put a greater strain on all of us, you know, to try and stay together and, and, and find a way a way out of it. I am, unlike you, a little bit more hopeful. I think, you know, we've seen infections level off. You know, they're not rising at anything like the rate that they were. I think the measures that we've, have been put in place seem to be having some effect and for the first time there's some real positive noises about a vaccine that, that that can make a difference aren't there so you know i'm i'm really hopeful that 2020 is going to be our anus horribus you know that 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 will be it and that when we get into 2021 you know we we, we will be a little bit wiser and and certainly you know it's gonna have a lasting effect i mean <laughs> Every time, I mean, there used to be a threat of these things, didn't they? Bird flu, and we were kind of a little bit complacent to it. But I mean, we're going to have to live with the fact that there's, there's we're going to be living in fear of something new like this, you know, coming. And and I, I imagine down the track that there might be periods where we have fairly draconian measures put in place very quickly, you know, to really try and stop it, you know. And 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 I think we'll have a different attitude to these things. Of course, we are. But I'm really hopeful that 2021 will be a better year, you know, and we can start rebuilding. And those people that have lost their jobs and have, have really suffered as part of this, you know, we we can start trying to put everyone's life back together because that's what it's going to be for the next, you know, three or four years. Hmm. Steve, I mean, I mean, you know, we, we talked about the sort of the, the, the fanship, but you'll have your own football opinions. And I was, I was reading something about, Frank De Boer, and I think when he'd had his bad start, the, the transfer window might still have been open. And he said, oh, I want to buy what was a top championship player. You were obviously more concerned with the Premier League. And you've since said you, you, you were thinking, oh, blimey, how on earth is this fella going to help us? I mean, how do you not meddle with the football is, I guess, my question, being that you're a passionate fan of the club yourself. Or do you meddle with the football? I mean, you can't be there and not be involved in the football. I mean, it's 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 there's there's budgets and there's you know even if you're just presenting, look, you know, we could buy him and him, or we could buy him, him, him and him. You know, with the with the, with the finances. Obviously, in any businesses, you're there longer. You know, you put things in place. You try and get the right people. Recruitment in a football club is the hardest thing. You know, because you have to remember is whether a player is a success isn't just a given right you know just because you don't buy a player and they come to your football or they go to another football club and they do well doesn't mean that if you'd have bought them they'd have done well at your football club you know and if you talk to most players you know apart from the very exceptional ones you know the environment they're in the opportunities they get are a huge part of how the team plays are a huge part i mean watching patrick Bamford do extraordinarily well you know and and, and he had a very difficult loan spell with us where it didn't work for him you know, I think it's partly because of how we played at the time. You know, it didn't kind of suit his style. He, I remember we went to South Africa on a, on a pre-season tour and he missed one of those one-on-ones with the goalkeeper and it felt like a seminal moment for a young player, you know, just kind of that from then, he, you know, I, I, he would have to speak for himself, but it felt like he was a little bit less confident, you know, with a goal score, he didn't quite get the goals. It didn't work out for him. Fantastic, because he's a smashing lad to see him last week, you know, absolute rave reviews, three goals, you know, fantastic goals as well. So, you know, when you're discussing recruitment of a player, the environment, what the, obviously what the manager thinks, is the player going to get downtime? Do you have somebody in the academy coming through? You know, it's a very, very complex process to try and get right. So, of course, everybody's involved in it. You know, we're all trying to find the, the right answer. You know, do I, you know, if Roy says 
this is the left back for me because he does this, this, and this. I, I'm not going to disagree with him. It's Roy Hodgson. You know, he knows what he's talking about. And that's, the, that's the left back he wants. As long as the other criteria suit the club, you know, in terms of age and profile and what we're trying to achieve, then obviously that's the one we would try and, and go for. At the same time, trying to keep the pathways from the academy open and all these complex things that Bobby Freeman and sporting directors are involved with. So, you know, it really is a team effort to, to get it right. Um, and that's the same in any football club. Steve, I want to take, to finish off, I want to take it back to you and what makes you tick and what the buzz is and stuff. Can we talk about challenges, first of all? Because you've, you've painted a sort of picture of quite a, what feels like fast track trajectory towards success. But there must have been hurdles along the way. So, so what was it inside you that got round them or over them? And, and, and how do you self-manage? How do you look after your own emotional situation? Um, I, I think probably I just I don't like to fail and I don't like to let people down. And certainly in my advertising business, a desire to not let people down was, yeah. was a, a huge one, you know, and um, that drove me. Um, in terms of, I don't know whether innately, because of my upbringing and my dad and the way that he thought, I always think that there's there, there might be an answer, that nothing's impossible, or whether it's something you learn in business, you know, that there's normally a way around it. One of the wonderful things about working in advertising is that you do pretty much everything at the last minute. So it does, it teaches you the extraordinary things that can be achieved in absolutely no time. Um, so, and then from a personal point of view, you know, obviously I had a strong marriage when I was, when I was doing that, two lovely kids, you know, good family environment to, to lean on. Um, things didn't work out in the end, but you know, it, it, it it was a good bedrock and a base, um, good friends, really good people that work with me. You know, I had people that work with me for the whole duration. In the end, um, you know, many of them I made shareholders of the business. We were all pointing in the same direction. I think that's one of the things I recognise about, certainly in that day, you know, when people went into corporate life, I always think what a destabilising you know, you never really know who's with you or, you know, who's trying to get your job. And I can't be doing with any of that politics. I'm not interested. In fact, I was having a conversation. You know, all I care about is where we're trying to go. I don't care about trying to look like I've got all the answers on the way to the journey, trying to look good in meetings, or I just want to get to where we're trying to go. And if that means I have to change my mind, I have to admit I'm wrong. I don't like it. But, you know, because innately we don't like doing that, do we? But that's what's necessary. You know, one of the things I found when I came into football was there was an enormous amount of machismo and testosterone and people who would, based on nothing really, tell you that this is exactly what you should do. Like, you know, they had some kind of crystal ball and extraordinary confidence that, the, you know, what they thought was the right thing to do. And, a, and an inability to just knock it around, right, and try and find the right answer and look at it from different angles and look at the data and look at the information and try and see, you know. Um, and, and you know, I think that's one of the things that I bring to it. But it's fairly difficult being you when you're like that, right, because I never think the first answer is something we should do. I always think unless you do the work on making the decision, you've got no one but yourself to blame if it goes wrong. Now, I, you know, you can ne you never know whether decisions are going to be the right or wrong decision. You, you know, as you get more experience in something, you can really work, you know, you know a lot of them are, and that's what experience in an industry or business gives you. But the, a lot of them, you don't know how they're going to work out. All you can do is do the work to make sure that you've looked at the thing from every single angle and based on the knowledge and the facts that you've got at the time, that it was the best way forward, right? And that's the only way, in my opinion, that you can ever live with yourself when things go wrong, right? If you can look back and go, well, I was ne the thing that ended up being right, I was never going to do it. I was never going to do it because the data and the facts and the information and what we are, who we are, we just never would have done that. Now, we might change that next time because we've learned about that. If you make decisions off the cuff, all your worst decisions are made off the cuff in my opinion. You know, if you make decisions off the cuff, you don't spend the time 
but that's it's a fairly agonising process, right? And of course, it's it's slightly more difficult in football because football has this absolute deadline all the time. You are playing on Saturday. The season starts then. You have to have a team. And this is why it's a lot easier in football than in normal businesses to make mistakes. In my advertising business, if somebody came to me with an idea, buy this company or we should start doing this, and I didn't fancy it right now, I just didn't do it right now. You know, there was always that option. We're, we're fine as we are, but we'll look at it down the track. Whereas in football, you know, you need a squad of 23, 25 players to start and you need to have some kind of certainty that they're good enough to do whatever it is that your goal is, whether it's Champions League or staying in the league. And you can only buy the players that really are available at the time. I mean, unless you've got unlimited money, you can't make people sell players to you. So, you know, that compresses all of that decision-making into a shorter period of time. I think it's something we've improved on drastically, you know, in terms of, um, and then you get opportunities thrown to you out of the blue, you know, oh, that's quite interesting. You know, we can get this player or that player. So, but I think it all goes back to the same principles. Do the work, agonise over it, look at it, find out as much information as you can and make the decision based on as much information as possible, which also involves looking at all the alternatives, which again is painstaking and drives everybody mad. But if you want to get your best chance of guaranteeing successful outcomes, it's the only way to do it. But it's a bit of a nightmare because you're never content. And, you know, the concept you sit at the top of these businesses and you're your own boss and, you know, you are. But all that is is just responsibility. That In the end, every single decision is down to you. Everybody that works in the business you chose or you chose the people that chose them, right? So everything, that's the way I feel. So when you talk about... A, a public business like Crystal Palace, you know, when you lose or you're not doing well or, the, you know, the stadium development looks like it's getting further away and not nearer, all of those things I take them personally because they're all my fault because they are, <laughs> right? But that is, it's, it's, it, you're a constant malcontent really to yourself, you know, it, it, and it's, it's, you know, maybe enjoyable not doing that and it isn't for everybody. I mean, this series is about sort of reflecting on people's journeys. Do you ever reflect on yours? Do you think back to that kid who hadn't got a clue what was going on in that business you were describing earlier for three or four months, through all the stages you've been to? Are you the same person at heart as well? Because you you have a very different life now. The fan who owns the football club, you know, you you nearly became a dragon in the dragon's den, you, what you're wearing gets scrutinised in the tabloids, but are you essentially the same person? Yes, very much so. And, I, you know, I don't think my goals, aims, things I want to do every day, you know, are, are any different. You know, I, I, I am. I think I don't think you can really, you can't really change who you are, can you? You know, you, you, you know I, I'm fortunate or unfortunate that it leads me to be able to do some you know have some fantastic opportunities to do some fantastic things obviously deprives you of some other things you know i mean it's not you know you see people that probably got you know stronger family lives and and you know they give more time to that they're much more content in those you know and and you can be jealous and envious of that but it isn't who you are so you know what can you do (laughs) I want to finish one principle, one belief, one mantra that has carried you through your working career from that moment of rejecting that initial job and being, you know, chalked off at the job centre right through to now. What's the one thing you've always carried with you, please? That's you put me on the spot. But, I mean, I think there's always another way to do it. There's, yeah. always, there's always another way to do it. There's always a solution. I love it. I love it. That's a brilliant way to finish. Steve, I've enjoyed every second of that. Thanks for sharing. Brilliant. Love talking to you. I'm Mark Lemmett. Thanks for watching. Hope you can join us again soon for another episode from our Global Insight Series.